Hey, welcome. My name is Keith Brooks, and we're going to talk about a new TV show on the History Channel called Lost Gold World War II. It's about Yamashita's gold, and it takes place in the Philippines. Let's just get started, and today I'm just going to talk about the players. My name is Keith Brooks. I wrote the book, um, The Great Gold Swindle, 70, uh, Yamashita's Gold, 75 Years of Corruption. And we're going to be talking about the players in this this episode here before the series begins and I'll try to get some more episodes up tonight and so let's just go first of all Operation Golden Lily this was a uh, inspiration and named aptly after one of Emperor Hirohito's favorite poems and it was made popular by Sterling Seagraves who wrote the Yamamoto Dynasty and the Marcos Dynasty books and he stumbled across this fact here and this is where we now know about Operation Golden Lily. Basically, the Japanese were, after World War I, was a very poor country and they actually had to bring in um, money from overseas. They only had, they gained Saipan from the Germans during World War I and they had um, sugar cane in there and they had parts of China and parts of Korea, or Korea as colonies. But what they wanted to do was to establish a policy called Asia for Asians and this way they would kick out all of the colonists like Dutch the Americans the English and control the whole Southeast Asia Southeast Pacific Rim by themselves so one of the policies they had was they, they went into China and this is where the rape of Nanking happened and this is where they killed over 30,000 people and the logo or slogan or whatever they had the battle cry was kill all take all so they would go to the banks they would take all the gold all the money out of the banks they would take go to people's houses just steal from them kill them they would force the daughters or some women into forced prostitution and it was bad so it was called the rape of nanking a kill all take all and so basically when this happened this is where world war ii started they started uh, they made a agreement with Italy and Germany that they would fight for them but they would not tack on the west coast of the or the east coast of of Russia in order to prevent uh, being over expanded at the time but it probably would have helped Germany out if they did and so Emperor Hirohito came into power in 1926 and that was the death of his father and so basically they started leapfrogging over every single country to take over. It was very easy for them to fight until they came to Singapore. And General Yamashita actually created a very brilliant plan and attacked Singapore and defeated Singapore rather quickly. And basically, the British were, uh, morale, the morale has suffered so bad that they just surrendered. And the Japanese truthfully had no ammunition left they were drained and so if the British held out for another week or two they would have won the war all right so this happened in February March of 1941 on December 7th 1941 the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor a couple hours later they attacked the Philippines north of Baguio and that was reported on December 8th because of the international date line. One will be the 8th, one will be the 7th, and they're only two, three hours apart, four, not half a world away, not even half a world away. Uh, like in, in Hawaii might be up in here, the Philippines would be down in here, so somewhere, so <laughs> down in here. So basically, basically it was only like three. I'd say maybe eight, less than an eight hour difference from the time zone and about an eight hour difference from when they attacked. So they both got attacked at pretty much the same time. So the United States declared war on Japan. Within a few months, Japan conquered the Philippines. And this was December 7th, 1941. And so when MacArthur came back and he attacked the South, he actually went back up up on the Philippines and attacked the same place that the Philippines was attacked by Japan and it came back and drove down the same path that the Japanese took 
And so one of the theories is there was an Operation Golden Lily. This was inspired by the poem or the favorite poem of the emperor. And I read one, but I'm not sure if that's the right one. Sterling Seagraves, he actually told me that he did not, he's never seen the poem itself. And so he entrusted his brother, Prince Chichubu, and Prince Eo, o Eo Aka to be leaders of this. And so they went to China and they helped take out everything from China. And so they, now they went to Singapore and every country they came to, they would uh, strip the national uh, banks of all their gold and all the money out of the bank accounts and all the gold. So you would hear stories like in Thailand recently where some Buddhist monks were cleaning a Buddha statue that was ceramic and it accidentally chip it and find out that it was actually a solid gold Buddha statue. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And they did this so the Japanese would not steal it. Nowadays, you'll have treasure hunters in the Philippines, 175, uh, 175 sites claiming that they have maps. Now, if you really read into this story and this myth and this treasure hunting legend, legend you'll notice that there are a lot of inconsistencies. For instance, uh, there was a prince named Prince Kinsu, and he reportedly gave a man named Ben Velmores control of the 175 maps. Now, Ben Vilmores worked for Ferdinand Marcos in a group called Lieber, L-E-B-E-R, and he became a pointer after the war to show people where the gold was buried. And he supposedly worked with Yamashita doing all this gold burying and everything around the entire country, so he was privy to all the information. And so the maps were written on waxed rice paper. Say that five times real fast. I think that's a good tongue twister we have. And supposedly they were buried in the areas of Maltaban, Antipolo, uh, Baru, Nueva, Hesita, Teresa, one and two, and Isabella. These were the locations most of the gold were buried. And it was written in a 2,000 year old script called Kanji. Kanji, Kanji. And again, it was on waxed rice paper. Uh, but nobody knows the origin of the text. And during Yamashita's trial, it was 8,000 pages of testimony, but not one mention about gold, gold being buried, treasure looting, or anything to that effect. It was all about crimes against humanity. So let's just go back again. Okay, so we got established the, the uh, gold mines, markers, and stuff like that. There was a man named Robert Curtis. He was from Sparks, Nevada, and he worked for Marcos. His job was to smelt the gold and so they could money launder it or launder it around the world, sell it on the open market, and not be and not it not it being found that it was actually stolen World War II loot, because World War II loot would have had to been returned to um, the country of origin. Now one of the countries of origin that's big is Cambodia. Cambodia was, in the Japanese eyes, a worthless country to invade. Now, Cambodia is very beautiful. I lived there five years. It's like my second home. I love the country. But militaristically and financially, the Japanese were not interested in the country at all. So they came in, they took over the country, and they left like an outpost. That's all it was. It was just an outpost during World War II. And so then they went to Malaysia and then on to Singapore, etc. And Sing the bars of gold probably are not from Cambodia. Now, Robert Curtis' was, job was to smelt the gold. Now, what he did was he didn't believe there was that much gold when Marcos told him. So Marcos told him he will take him around and show him places that had gold. So he took him to uh, Corregidor and showed him a vault in Corregidor, which was loaded with gold from the ground up. He took him to his summer palace, or his winter palace, north of Manila, that which was basically Ferdinand Marcos's mansion, and took him to the basement, and that, again, was full of gold. 
from brim to basement. And he took him place to place to place. And every time he was blindfolded, he did not know where he was going. They joined, had a group called Lieber Group, L-E-B-E-R. So Robert Kurtz was part of this group. Ben Bell Morris was part of the group. Uh, Olaf Johansson, a psychic, was part of the group because they were going to find out where these 175 burial groups were. They had all maps from Ben Bell Morris. And so basically they looked around the Philippines. Robert Curtis claimed that he had approximately, they, they found approximately 12, 12 to 15 burial sites. Many people out of the Philippine military after Marcos was deposed sued Marcos or tried to sue, sue him for not giving him their fair share when they found these sites. But no one has ever come forward and said, yes, these are the sites and this is how much money was found. Marcos and his family has that much power to this day. Uh, okay, so what happened was in 1971, there was a man named Roger Rojas, Rogelio Rojas, who worked with another Filipino and a son of a Japanese soldier. And they discovered behind the Baguio Hospital a tunnel, a cave, and they went in and with some railroad tracks, they moved everything and they discovered a golden Buddha statue that was about three feet tall. It's the picture you see me with earlier there. That is the fake Buddha statue, I'll just say, and I'll, I'll explain to you in a little bit. So Rojas estimated there was 1,800 bars of gold in this cave. And so it took them a few weeks. They got all the, they got the Buddha statue off. They got the, they got the uh, uh, 18 bars of gold, 17, 12, whatever. It was a, just a few bars. What he wanted to do was sell the bars of gold or the Buddha statue in order to finance getting all the gold out. In the meantime, with Philippine laws, he had to go to the courthouse and register the fine. And every time he went to the courthouse, the judge, P, I believe his name is, always made himself not available. But Rojas knew where he lived because it, he used to be a cook for him, went over and demanded to know why he was never available. And he said, Fernandez Marcos, and called him the prince, told him not to be available. And so while he was trying to sell the, the statues, he met a, name, met a man named Robert Cheatham, who was in the army, I believe, at the time. And he came and looked at it, and he was a treasure hunter himself. And he said he could not afford, I believe it was like 100000 for the statue. And so he took pictures of it and sent it to some treasure hunting friends in the United States to see if they would be interested in buying it or financing Rojas's uh, journey to get the rest of the gold out. And within a few days, another man came and he did some tests on the Buddha statue and then he left. Now the Buddha statue weighed 870 pounds, give or take. And it, its head came off. And so they wound up uh, photographing it. The guy came over and did an assay test on it, took some under the arm, drove a little hole up, Pulled it out. Now he said that it took a while for him to get the assay. I mean, the gold. Um, gold is very soft, so it would have took him a few seconds just to go right up there and bring that gold right out. He was an operative for the Philippine government, and a few days later, he came back with the federal marshals, the NBA, uh, NBI, the you know, it's like the FBI in the Philippines, and they. Arrest, uh, they stole the statue, they stole the bars of gold, and they stole his wife's coin collection. And so that's when he went and he told uh, the judge, why didn't you file the claim? And he said, Marcos wouldn't let me. And then he found out that there was a an arrest warrant out for him for having a concealed weapon. In the Philippines, it is illegal to own a weapon in the Philippines. So the next several years, he fought the Philippine government. He was imprisoned, he was tortured, he was beaten up. And so the only protection he had was some rebel uh, Philippine senators. Now, when he, Grisham came, or Cheatham came, I'm sorry. When Cheatham came to take pictures of the uh, Buddha statue, 
it made national headlines. It, I mean, worldwide headlines. It just, everybody was just like, wow, this guy just found a huge stash of gold. And it made front page of the Stars and Stripes newspaper, which is distributed to military members around the world. And he was called into the office and Marcos read it and made a big deal. It was like, why is this army guy meddling in Philippine affairs? So he was told to separate himself from from Rojas or he would go to Vietnam and which he did but on the other hand all the international press came to the Philippines wanting to know where the Buddha statue was they wanted to know how much I mean they were just interested in it and so he went out and said Marcos stole it a few days ago and so it winds up that Marcos said no I have the statue I'll return it to you all you got to do is go to this Buddha, uh, go to the Baguio City Hall, and then we will you identify it. You can have it back, and everything's fine. So he went to the City Hall with a bunch of senators and international press and everybody around. He looked at it and said, This is not my statue. The head came off. This one doesn't. The color is wrong. This is not my statue. And so he was thanked by the opposition senators and he went into hiding. And that's where his downfall and torture began because he was actually taken to an Angeles City and beaten at a hotel near Angeles City in the Philippines and beaten. And he was taken, captured in Baguio and arrested. Well, in a Baguio, since he was a locksmith by trade, he knew how to pick a lock. And he picked a lock in the bathroom and escaped through the window and... Through family and friends, he made it out of Baguio. But he was tortured so badly that his eye, I believe it was his right eye, just bulged right out and he was blind. Because he they used car batteries and they electrocuted him. And so after Marcos was deposed, Rojas sued Marcos and won a 43 billion B, with a B, billion dollar lawsuit against Marcos for the theft of the Golden Buddha statue and <laughs> theft of the Golden Buddha statue. And, uh, but it got reduced to a couple, like $300 million because they said it was too speculative. They couldn't prove there was 1,800 bars of gold and they couldn't prove that how much the Buddha statue weighed. In the court documents in Hawaii, I believe it was 870 pounds. That's what they claimed it at. Marcos enlisted Robert Curtis and and Ben Valmores and several others to find more sites. Now, Robert Curtis' story gets a little interesting. He said that, like, July 4th, like 1972, 1973, General Ver, the, the right-hand man to Marcos, took him to the American Memorial Cemetery in Manila, took him to a grave that was open and had his name on it, pulled the gun out, put it to his head, and apologized, said, I'm ordered to kill you. And he told him flat out, look, we found 12 sites, we'll find 12 more. And he did a lot of talking. After, after that, uh, he was let go. And uh, he took the 175 maps that he was entrusted with. Now, he had the 175 maps. He photocopied, not photocopied, but he took a Polaroid picture of them and then burnt all the pictures and then proceeded to go to the Manila airport and leave the country. And it wound up that uh, the military or Marcos or someone found out that he was on the plane and they went to the airport and they stopped the plane from leaving and then boarded the plane and told him to get off. But he said he wasn't getting off. It was an American flight. It was an American vessel and they had no jurisdiction over it since he already cleared customs which they, the, the police or military people actually left and let him off on the plane to let him leave. Now, he came back years later after Marcos was deposed, and he worked with the Philippine government to try to locate more gold, but he never did. There was a Green Beret that came to the Philippines and looked, and he was looking in Fort Santiago, and there was a cave-in, and it was a very big embarrassment for the Philippine government to admit that they were looking for Yamashita's gold. In fact, I was actually there. This is the first time I ever even heard of Yamashita's gold. 
I was walking in Fort Santiago and they were doing some construction and digging and everything. And I, I said, what are they doing? So I thought it was kind of weird. And I thought maybe they were improving the place or whatever. But one of the people that was, they said, they're looking for Yamashita's gold. I had no clue what they were talking about. And then a few months later, a few weeks later, I'm watching TV and there was a movie in the Philippines called Yamashita's Gold. And uh, they showed the Buddha statue and I'm like, what is this about? And then my ex-wife told me, this is about Yamashita's Gold where this guy found this big uh, cache of gold and Marco stole. No gold has ever been found since 1971. If there's 175 sites, 48 years later, one of them would have been found. None have been found. The only thing that has been found, to my knowledge, was a boat going to, that was sank during World War II, that was going to Japan, that was full of platinum. And that was the only thing I've ever heard, ever found. All right, so during during um, the lawsuit against Marcos, there was a man that name came up, and his name was Servino Garcia Santa Romano, also known as Father Ho Jose Diaz La Paz. And they they really were shocked to discover that this guy, after doing research, was just a typesetter from the United States, a Filipino-American typesetter. And he wound up having something like $2 billion, with a B, in the bank account. He had over 100 bank accounts with over $2 billion, gold, bonds, and money. And no one knows where he got this money from. So the story is it could have been the Black Eagle Trust Fund. Now, the Black Eagle Trust Fund was a fund created by the CIA, the fund created by the CIA to uh, finance operations around the world, blackmail public officials, fix elections, destabilize countries, assassinate and plots, and... Uh, they were really wanting to know where this money came from. They can never, ever find out. And they believe that the Black Eagle Trust Fund had over $110 billion in it. But there was also a, a rumor that a Garcia, a Romano, <laughs> Garcia, Santa Romano, actually worked with um, Edward Lansdale, who was a military officer at the time, and he was working for the CIA, and he actually became the CIA director. And they believe that they both of them tortured the driver of Yamashita's uh, car, or Yamashita's driver, and to find 12 locations, and all that money and gold and everything was deposited into the Black Eagle Trust Fund bank accounts. Lansdale actually became the CIA director about 10 or 15 years later and he was fired by Kennedy he was fired by Kennedy so and then they thought during the revolution against Marcos the USS Eisenhower came in and removed 63 tons of gold from the Philippines this came out and so many people wanted to know is this true or not true no one really knows but there's the speculation is MacArthur Romana and Yamashita's wife helped remove gold now this one is just way out there because MacArthur loved the Philippines. He would never ever work with Yamashita's wife. He despised the Japanese that much for what they did to the Philippines. Most of the uh, areas, like I said, were Maltban, Antipolo, Baru, Nueva Hesita, Teresa 1 and 2, and Isabella. And Baguio is about 90 miles from where the show is being filmed. And I'll get into in the first episode about uh, the Japanese there. But like I said, there was 8,000 pages of Yamashita's trial, which said, never talked about gold. So no one even believes that there was gold actually there. And in Isabella, in, uh, uh, you can actually visit the Japanese tunnels there. And it's about $1 for entry. And you can actually travel and go through there. And let's see what we got here. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, that's it for right here. If I see anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to stuff during the episodes here. So let's just call it that one and wait till the next episode. Thank you.